they uh, at the literally like the last last second they bowed out because the the merger between PayPal and eBay they offered them a, a crap load of money to stay and work to on the on the connection between PayPal and eBay and getting all that integrated. Welcome to Get Real 411, the podcast where real experts give real advice on all things real estate. I'm Jamie. And I'm Brad. Join us as we explore real estate successes and pitfalls through the eyes of our esteemed guests. Now let's get real. Today we have with us my good friend Jason Frazier, the EVP of Growth at Lead Pops, marketing master, coach to many loan officers through Next Level LOs, and uh, just an all-around fantastic person. How are you today, Frazier? Uh, I am fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I, I appreciate you guys having me on here. And uh, hey, it's, it's, a, it's a great day. I'm, I'm excited. Great day. We're super excited to chat with you today, Jason, because we know that our audience is going to get so much out of this. You are known in our industry as a marketing guru, and it's all about real estate. So we definitely want to dive in and listen to your story, how you got involved, you know, coming up into this business, what you're doing today, and how you're helping people to market to the consumer in this crazy environment we're in right now that's so different than where we were just six months ago. So yeah, why don't we no, start I with just your background? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's uh, I was uh, I was born into the mortgage industry, uh, literally, and my uh, my mom was uh, uh, working for a mortgage company uh, or she started as a receptionist uh, at uh, a, a mortgage company. It's a family owned business called Mason McDuffie. Uh, actually, it's one of the oldest mortgage companies in the country, uh, founded in 1887 out of Berkeley, California. And three days after I was born, I was on a little uh, baby carrier on her desk. I believe she was the closing manager at the time, um, but she actually ended up being the first uh, woman CEO of a mortgage company in this country. And uh, so I, was, I, I grew up in the industry, uh, had family that was in the industry, real estate, mortgage. And so I, it's, I've, it's just something that I've been around my entire life. And, but my, my path went differently, uh, mostly because my mom told me not to get in the mortgage industry, uh, you know, growing up. But um, you know, it's one time maybe I should have listened to my mom, but uh, but I didn't. Uh, I went into um, uh, you know I went into technology, and um, there's a whole story on how that happened. But save you guys that boring story, and just let you know that. So I I came up in the world of uh, technology startups, venture capital. I used to work for Peter Thiel, who is one of the founders of PayPal, um, and uh, that was a great world to be a part of. It it actually shaped a lot of how I think differently and and how i uh how i look at um, the financial markets and everything else and it actually there's a lot of synergy between uh working in a hedge fund and, and being in the mortgage market and in 09 uh i uh i took a sabbatical um i really i made a lot of money i didn't really need to work um and uh my my uh uh, family's company, Mason McDuffie, was going through kind of a, a change, and they asked me to consult and audit their technology systems because that's what I was at the time, as being a, a you know VP, SVP of tech and a CIO, and and so I went and did that, and uh, they asked if I wanted to come on board. So I, I decided, uh, you know, hey, the, I think I thought it would be kind of fun to work uh, for my mom and and. Do, to, you know, kind of take up the mantle a little bit. And uh, so I, I did that in 09, you know, obviously the, the perfect time to get into to mortgage as it, as it uh, turns out, <laughs> turned out to be. Um, but um, it was, uh, it, it was, it was interesting. It was an interesting shift going into mortgage from where I was, you know, uh, working at a global macro hedge fund that had an AUM of just a little bit over 8 billion. Uh, <laughs> the dynamic is a little different. Technology is a little different. Uh, it was like going in a time machine with uh, all the tech that the mortgage company had and what they did. So I, I basically kind of rebooted that whole, world of, of tech that they had at, at, uh, at the company. And, um, and then over that, uh, that 10 year period, I, uh, you know, I held, uh, held a lot of different roles as the chief strategy officer, the chief technology officer and the chief marketing officer, and actually held all those roles at the same time. Uh, I got into marketing, uh, just almost as, as a necessity because I saw where we were going. I was doing, uh, because I came from the world of like the Facebooks, the LinkedIn's, the YouTube, um, I saw a a need to to help our company, you know, modernize our marketing and be out there on on social media. And at the time, our, our the marketing at, at our company just wasn't wasn't that it was bank marketing, so they just didn't even know that world. 
Uh, so in 2016, I, uh, I went all in on the, on the marketing front and, uh, you know, I, I did that, went on on my own, ran my own coaching company for a couple of years, then um, got back into the industry, did a lot of public speaking, still do that to this day. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the rest is, uh, rest is the, uh, the history of my story. I love it. I think one of the uh, things that resonates with a lot of our colleagues in the industry and one of the many reasons I think so many people follow you is you have, you know, that saying different is better. You, it's all about real talk being authentic because we know that consumers, they've heard it all and they've seen it all. And if you don't differentiate yourself, particularly in a market like we're in right now, which is inarguably incredibly challenging for a lot of folks, if you don't differentiate yourself now, you know, they're just going to go with the next guy on the block that appears to be cheaper, appears to be faster. And we have to educate our consumers on what makes us unique and best able to serve them. I think that's a lot of, of what you talk about. But the other cool thing about your background in tech is it plays directly into all of the coaching and advice that I see you giving. Um, I know that you just launched a couple of different things. Uh, I know that you launched a, um, a lead webinar I'd love to hear yep. more about that. And then I also know that you just launched the Next Level Community. And I know you've got several hundred loan officers between both of those that are tuning in to get some best practices on how to thrive through this market. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, during my time, I've rent, uh, I ran direct to consumer for a couple of years and, uh, and, and I did that through paid and I also did that through just organic marketing. And so since 2016, I've, I've generated a little bit over 300 million in closed, uh, closed loans. Um, through my marketing. And so with the Leads webinar, it's leadswebinar.com, and it's a free service. I, I did this simply because uh, our industry uh, is horrible at lead generation. And then you have outsiders coming in to sell loan officers leads, not understanding from a loan officer perspective, not understanding that um, the leads that are sold to our industry in a given year go back to 2019. It was 150 million, or sorry, 125 million. And that, in that year, there was 5.5 million transactions. So um, without boring you with the math, basically out of all the leads that were sold, less than 2% had a chance of, of closing from, from paid ads. So that means 98% had zero chance of closing. That's a lot of wasted money in a given year. This year, it's probably going to be around $88 million in leads sold to our industry. And so what I wanted to do was take the blueprint of success that I've had with, with lead generation and create an online training that will give them a to Z of everything on how to generate leads organically, how to do paid, uh, paid advertising, how to uh, do the scripting, the follow-up, the calls, and everything else. And look, this, this was stuff that I created based off of listening to other awesome lead people, right? Um, like a Chris Smith, a curator. Uh, the conversion code is one of my Bibles when it comes to uh, conver converting leads. And so I used all of this, you know, because it's simply not something that's done in our industry. They'll, they'll listen to another loan officer or they've been kicked around from one office to another or whatever. And they just, they just do what they know. So it's not their fault. So I take, I, you know, I take the, the training from, from global marketers that deal with high, you know, high volume industries and verticals. Cause that, cause that marketing is still the same. And that's another you know problem with our industry is we think that real estate and mortgage, the marketing has to be different, which is just stupid because a consumer is a consumer, regardless of product, it's all about decision science and understanding why people say yes. And then understanding the message and what resonates with them and then deploy that. Uh, yes. That, yes. It's different. Right. Just like a product if I was selling makeup or selling, you know, books or it, it really doesn't matter because, it, like I said, a consumer is a consumer. So I'm taking all of this and leadswebinar.com to train them to, to how to be successful generating leads. And I'm doing that because I feel that, you know, one, this industry has given me a lot. And I wanted to give back in a way that was meaningful at a time where I think loan officers need it the most. And that's how do I generate business. But I also feel that they give up so quickly on lead generation because they think that it's deals on a platter and they don't understand that majority of the people in the country don't have good credit. They don't understand that it's about a six to 12 month nurture at best for internet leads and understanding that if you're, if you are, if you are converting at, let's say three to 5%, you are considered like the platinum standard gold standard of lead conversion. They think that they get a lead, they should be able to convert it. And it just doesn't work that way. So there's a massive, um, you know, misunderstanding of, of what, uh, and not comprehending what it takes to, to do, you know, successful lead generation at scale. And so that's what leads webinar is. The other thing is, uh, I'm a coach, uh, for next level, like you mentioned, and, 
We just launched an online community that's off of social uh, social media because we, we knew that the future is not going to be on Facebook with everything that's happening on there. And you can't even say certain words now. And I'm not even getting into like, like I'm, I'm talking like just dumb stuff that you say and you get flagged for it. And you get, you know, in, in Facebook jail for 30 for 30 days for something that was nothing. And uh, so we, we knew that we and we had a couple of friends that we knew that got, uh, you know, their Facebook groups closed down or they lost their account completely. And it really screwed up their business. So we knew that if we were going to create a, a scalable business, we had to be off of social media because we don't own that. It, you're, you're just renting the attention on there. You don't own any of that. So we, uh, we created this uh, new community, and it's, a, it's an app. It's online, and it's it's just amazing. And so one of the things that I did uh, just to, to try to get everyone jazzed up uh, for the for the rest of this year is I did a 60 day launch on November 1st, a 60 day marketing sprint. So I got about 90 people in that mastermind and that coaching group while I'm, ha- I'm helping them every day, accountability and coaching calls once a week, but every day they get something that they could use uh, to do. And, you know, and, and I don't need to tell you guys this, but we know that the 80, 20 rule in our business is, is a hundred percent live and well, meaning that, you know, 80% of your business as a lender is done or a brokerage is done for, by your top 20%. Sometimes it's your top 10 or top 15. And so what I'm trying to help the loan officers at the next level that have rose, raised their hand and said that I want to I be better, I want to be the best, whatever that version is for them, we don't try to put make a mold of a perfect LO and say you need to be that like other coaching programs do. We say, look, what do you want to be as a loan officer? How successful? What does success mean to you? Because it's a different answer for every loan officer, depending on where they're at in their life. And so that's what we do is we help loan officers be the best version of what they want to be, not what we think they should be. And through that community, we you know we pour everything that we can into them to, to help them win because we know if we could help them be the 20%, especially since so many people are tapping out of this market and there's going to be more attrition and there's going to be just you know more volatility for the foreseeable future, like you know, business can be done. We're still going to be at, you know, maybe 1.1 trillion in business done this year, even in a bad market. So which really isn't that far off when you think about compared to the last two years, it is, but historically it isn't. And, you know, what I always say is that business is always done regardless of what the market conditions are. It just, the difference is who's doing the business. And so we want those people to be the 20%. And that's what leads webinar, what we're doing with coaching, what we're building at lead pops, all of that is working in conjunction with each other to create what I call a growth ecosystem for the, for the, and I hate saying the modern loan officer, but for the, uh, it, I would say for the enlightened, for the elite originator. Yeah. And, you know, talking about leads a little bit and, and talking about perception and marketing, I think so often the mistakes I see originators make is that they see things through their own lens and they don't understand that the consumer, for example, doesn't understand the different channels of the mortgage industry, doesn't understand necessarily even completely the difference between where the real estate agent stops and the loan officer begins. And so when we when we begin to look at things through the eyes of our actual audience and we're targeting yep. our marketing for the intended audience instead of what we think that we would like to see, the game changes. And then Conversely, generating leads is amazing. In and of itself, that's a, an art form. What you do with them, though, yeah. is all the difference of what your conversion conversion ratio really is. And Brad and I have talked about this for ages and ages and ages. It's that lack of consistency. If you don't have a cadence to those leads, if you're not following up in a certain way every time, you know, you're lowering your own percentage of success because you're not yeah. applying the same method to every single lead that comes in the door. Jason, I'd like to, um, you know, you're doing a lot, right? Before we kind of get to your current gig at Lead Pops and what you're doing over there, um, yep. you brought up a few things I actually didn't know about you. The tech background being one, working with Peter Thiel. I think that's super interesting. I want to dive into that. But before I do that, you said, you know, you're, you're giving these marketing ideas. 60 days, just pack filled. I would, I would love it if you could share with us in our audience just one, just one great marketing idea. Just give them a taste of what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to just like, but I'll, I'll tell you like an example of something that I did with a coaching group, right? right? And it's not really a marketing. I mean, it is, but I just, it's more about also being intelligent about the data that you have in front of you that doesn't cost you anything. So what I did was I gave uh, everyone um uh, basically you could search for like anything right on, on, on Google and see, and Google will actually give you the recommendations based off of what users are searching for in a given month. And so what I did was, and then there's also a, a great tool called answer the public that kind of helps like validate some of that as, as well. 
And so what I did is I said, for getting a mortgage, these are the top five things that people were asking, right? Like self-employed, no credit. And what and and to Jamie's point, when it's talking about having that lens of understanding your audience, what loan officers will put out is stuff that they're comfortable with. Things like, oh, I I I would I would answer that. Yeah, because you're in the business, right? Like I love football. If I was in football, I would love that. But is the normal consumer going to resonate with that message. And so what I did is I said, look, you don't you don't need to pull your hair out or pay money to find out what people are searching for. I'm giving it to you right now. So I gave them five things. I said, if you created, if all you did for the rest of this year was create videos, a podcast, blogs, articles, offer, look, people don't understand. You could reach out to any publication, you know, like a news, local news or whatever, and just say, hey, this is a common search term. And I know people are searching for it. Do you want some more traffic to your website? I could write as a mortgage professional about getting uh, getting a mortgage, uh, you know, um, as a self-employed uh, person, right? Or I could talk about, uh, you know, getting a mortgage, bad credit, or the number one question is, should I wait till 2023? to buy a house, right? And I and so you have content for days cuz you're a mortgage professional, you should be able to speak intelligently and have a conversation about all of that. And you don't have to just, you know, uh, shoot your shot just in, in one piece of content. You can then repurpose a blog post into multitude of different pieces of of content, which is also what I talk about as well uh, to the coaching group. But basically I just said, look, content is not that hard to find. You're overcomplicating what it is, but I gave them five top um terms as it relates to getting a mortgage and then i gave them the top uh three searches as it relates to mortgage and real estate in general and that's where the you know hey should i buy a house in 2022 because it's the conversations that we're not having it's like this whole hey now's a great time to buy a house and then i get why loan officers will kind of bark back at me when i say to stop saying that and i get it but again just like you said jamie it's about looking through their own lens. And so, you know, the, the marketing advice I say is, is that look like the, the content's there, you have content for days. If you've been in this, if you've been in this business for at least two years, look in your, you know, your sent folder, there's plenty of content in there because you're answering the same question probably over and over again. And, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, another thing just like, which is more tactical is like, Hey, I, I gave them, uh, the best times from a, a Monday through Friday, the best times to send an email. Right. So that, you know, so they know like, hey, this is the best time to get if they're doing prospecting or whatnot. These are the chances of getting, uh, you know, getting my email read or uh, the the perfect Instagram bio, how to how to how to, you know, do a, an Instagram bio that works or the best times to post on Instagram, but do it in a grid and understanding that it's there is no best time. But taking all the data from all the reports that are out there and showing them how to consolidate all of that so they can then test and learn and, and try it themselves. Sounds like a lot of very practical, like blocking and tackling, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, great ideas. Most people don't know that you can look up the traffic on search terms. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously for somebody who's a marketer, that's, a, you know, that's table stakes. Uh, but for those that don't, so it sounds like a really terrific group that uh, is going to get a lot of benefit before the end of the year here, which is perfect timing to take them into 2023. Yeah. The thing yep. about Frazier is, and one of the reasons we kind of became friends is we would you know, I would ask him for advice on something years back and, and he would just offer up knowledge with no ask in return. And then we started bouncing ideas off of each other. And we still do today, wherever we are, wherever we land, whatever we're focusing on from time to time, we'll ping one another. And it's really interesting that you can see how data focused everything that Jason does is because he has a way of taking all of that information, digesting it and giving it out to originators in a way that they can understand easily and implement into their daily business to see results. And yep. that is huge. It's a huge value to our industry. Yeah, most definitely. So so let's take a second now, uh, Jason, and go back in time, right? So you're, you're working for Peter Thiel. Yep. I want to hear about that experience. How close were you with him? You know, for those of the and, – and explain who Peter is to those that don't know. Yeah, so you know, Peter. Peter, I, I think people refer to him now as like a serial serial entrepreneur, you know, that type of stuff. But you know, back back then, he had uh, he was with Elon, and had just sold. When I when I met him, he had uh, him and Elon had just sold PayPal to eBay, uh, and that's actually um, 
it, it's funny is that so I was working for a construction management firm at that time running their technology and integration side. So basically, like if they were moving a client, I would help them procure quit, equipment, get it set up, work with their tech teams, that type of stuff. And so when um, we got and we were a small, small firm that ended up being absorbed by CBRE. Um, but um, the you know, when we, when we got, when we got him as a client, I was like, oh man, this is, that's pretty cool. You know, I heard of PayPal, obviously everyone had eBay at the time. This was 2002, 2001, somewhere around there, I think 2000, so, around, around there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I've been in tech, right. So like, I'm like, I'm, I'm geeking out about all this stuff. And so what had happened is, um, it's actually kind of, you know, kind of a cool story. I think so at least. And so I was working with the people at eBay because um, a lot of those uh, are sorry, the, the technology, uh, the technology guys at PayPal were working uh, with me because uh, Peter had hired them and they were going to go work for the hedge fund, which was Clarium Capital at the time, which is now uh, Teal Capital, um, but Clarium Capital at the time. And uh, they uh, at the literally like the last last second, they bowed out because the, the merger between PayPal and eBay, they offered them a, a crap load of money to stay and work to on the on the connection between PayPal and eBay and getting all that integrated. So basically, Peter was going to open up his hedge fund in two weeks. And there was probably about um, and they hadn't done anything because they had been so bogged down in this in the eBay PayPal stuff that I had two weeks to get the hedge fund completely up and running. I don't. But now the, the cool thing is I'd already procured. I bought all the equipment. I'd already done all of that. It was all sitting in their office it was at 555 California, the Bank of America building downtown financial district, San Francisco. So, um, so they were, they were screwed. And I, I went in there cause I'd already done all that. Like that's, you know, the, people don't understand, like, just cause of my background, that's like playing with toys for me, like building servers and setting up networks and stuff like that. Um, you know, cause I am a, a, a Cisco certified, uh, internet expert and I, I went out through all the certifications, top engineer. And, um, so I, I went in there and I, I basically, it was a basically two month job that I got done in two weeks. I slept mm. in their office. I slept on the server room. I got stuff, everything, uh, you know, just dialed in with uh, their networks, their T1s and all of that stuff. Uh, and it impressed the team. Now I wasn't working for like Peter directly. So I don't want to ever give like, Hey, I was in his inner circle or his best friend or what I, I got, I was, you know, as close as Peter as, as someone like me is going to get um, working with him, you know, in, in other areas with his family and stuff like that. And, um, and he trusted me enough to be the guy that he was, you know, there was some, you know, I can't get into too much of the details, but uh, for some of you that had seen the social network, the, the movie, mm -hmm. um, if you uh, look at um, this, I could talk about it now because it's, it's, it's public knowledge, but like if you, the scenes when they're in the courtroom and they're talking, looking at emails and IMs and stuff like that about that, those were things that I uncovered doing discovery uh, because of a, you know, court order. Right. And so like when we were going through like, uh, you know, getting their hard drive scanned and whatnot for the lawsuit and all that stuff, I was the one trusted enough to be there to make sure that there was no funny business. And, you know, and, and he trusted me enough to put him in anything that he invested in. I went in there to look at technology. Um, I consulted for those uh, the biggest name that you guys may or may not know, but a lot of people would is called Palantir, publicly traded company um, that does data modeling, works with the NSA, CIA. So I was there in the very beginning as a consultant for them. Um, and so, uh, so like that was a great world. It was, it was interesting. That's where I really learned what it means to be a contrarian. Um, when I, when I joined, uh, the hedge fund and, and again, don't take this wrong. This had nothing to do with me, but like, you know, I got there when we were, uh, I think we were maybe, um, a hundred, 150 million of AUM. And then in less than four years, got it to over eight point four, eight point five billion. Got to meet a lot of great people. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of, you know, people that are famous now. Uh, you know, some of the people I worked with uh served in the uh, Trump administration, ambassadors to countries, that type of stuff, uh working with the NSA as a consultant and 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 so uh um uh you know uh, people uh you know Sean Parker, you know, you saw him in the social network, you know, I knew him. Um so like it's 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 things of that. Um, you know, I was a trusted resource, you know, um for them to to use and you know and 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 it was a great time. I I would never uh I would never ever uh not 
had 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 that experience with those with just, i mean these people are once in a generation minds they they really are uh just different thinkers and it's hard to you know me like i, I don't come from an ivy league i'm talking these were stanford mbas yale uh harvard you know the like uh, mit like uh, chess grandmasters these were like serious brains and i was in the room and i was blessed enough just to be there and and i was not uh, stupid enough to let that go without me being a sponge and just really just trying to dissect how they thought, what they did to, uh, you know, when they invested and all, I didn't understand that world at all. Yeah. Um, but I, and I didn't really want to, but I wanted to know why they made the decisions that they did and let, and just be a, a fly on the wall because in my position running all of the technology and all the security for the company, I, I got exposed to a lot of data and, and, and everything. And, and, and I used all of that just to shape myself as a professional uh, to have a, a better and, and deeper understanding of what macroeconomics are and understanding um, why markets move the way they do. Man, I find that so interesting. Of course, we don't have a ton of time to go into <laughs> that deep, but just the fact that you were doing the due diligence and in, in the systems of the, of the companies they were looking to acquire or invest in, is pretty interesting. I wonder if we could just talk for a moment about your role at Lead Pops, and then Jamie's sure. going to have a question for you that she likes to ask all of our all of our guests. Talk to me about Lead Pops. We we uh, we've been Lead Pops customers in the past. Obviously, big fans of Andrews, and you know Brad and Andrew have actually uh, gotten to know each other a bit over the last year or so, and like to like to talk tech and compare notes and all that good stuff. So, tell us about this new venture. Yeah. So, um, you know, what I've discovered about myself is that, you know, it's, it's hard for me to work for a lender just because, I, you know, and, and it's not, and again, it, I don't want anyone to take this wrong. I, I love, you know, I had a great time working for an EPM at, at Victorian Finance, Card you know, uh, uh, Cardinal Financial. Um, but um, I enjoyed more being a consultant, working with, you know, like, uh, you know, consulting with a UWM or a Home Point, a Caliber, all those, you know, back in the day. And, um, I, you know, I, there's just too many guardrails that do, don't allow me to do what I know what I could do. And I get it, right? There's governance and stuff that you have to, you know, adhere to. And I just, I just don't like, I don't play well in those rules, uh, in those world. So, um, you know, when the opportunity at Lead Pops came up, you know, Andrew and I had talked about working together for a while. And before I went to um, Victorian, uh, Andrew, Andrew has like, you know, hey, let's talk. Let me throw my hat in the ring. Uh, but I already committed to, you know, to Victorian. And so I, you know, I, I didn't want to go back on what I committed to, but that, that was like the more um, exciting role for me is to come and work with Andrew because we align a lot on how we look at the industry, look at marketing. Uh, you know, I'm a marketer, pure and simple. And so I, I love what I do. So my, my job here is to not just grow the company of, um, of, uh, of Lee Pops through a very challenging time in the market, but also to make sure that our, our clients are in a better position than they are working with any other firm. And so, um, you know, I'm bringing my expertise from coaching, uh, leads webinars, another example of that, uh, my part, you know, my connections, that's one, another thing that I pride in myself as being a connector in this industry. So, uh, partnerships and things through other companies that, uh, you know, that I've had a relationship with, uh, you know, just as a consultant or as an advisor, um, bringing them together and figure out how we could lock arms at lead pops to create a true growth ecosystem in a time that is, that it's desperately yeah. needs in this industry. Now it's different. A lot of people don't understand it, but the clients that do get it, you know, they're reaping the rewards. And so my job is to help them, uh, you know, have a blueprint for success using our growth solutions uh, and then helping them create, you know, some, you know, some stickiness with our, you know, not just like, hey, we do this, we could generate leads, we have a funnel, uh, we could help you with your reviews and your local listings and all that stuff. But did you know that we, you know, you're going to get coaching? Once a month, did you yeah. know that you're going to get actual training that you would have to pay thousands of dollars for somewhere else that you're going to get for free with us? You're going to get content. You're going to get ways of, you know, because I people don't know. I coach agents for two years, right? So I've worked on the real estate side. I've spoken at, you know, CA, uh, CAR at their Reimagine conference. I've spoken on Inman at San Francisco and Las Vegas and New York. In fact, at the time that I spoke on the main stage, I was the only other mortgage professional that's ever done that prior to me was Anthony Shea of Loan Depot. And so like it, you know, so... I know the real estate world very well. And so I use that to help create relationships because I know what agents want. You know, I've, I've spent thousands of hours in focus groups help, you know, just trying to understand agents. I did it for my loan officer so I could create stronger and better relationships. Uh, so I'm taking all of that knowledge, everything that I've done for the last 13 years in this industry, 
and I'm pouring it all into lead pop so that our clients will be with us. They'll be with us for life because there's no way they're going to get any other be better value anywhere else. That's pretty awesome. Very fortunate that people that sign up and work with you. Well, different is better. And yeah, uh, you're, you're being the differentiator <laughs> like you always are. Um, okay. So I do have a question for you. Yep. It's a good one. What would you tell your 20 year old self? What advice would you give that person? Yeah. You know, I, it, it's these, it's so, it's so funny. I, I, if I went back to my, and it's tough for me, right? Because at, a lot of people don't know I had my son when I was 20, right? So like, you know, my, my, my oldest, I have three kids, uh, you know, my son, uh, Nicholas, uh, Nick, he's, he's my oldest. He actually still lives in, in California with his mom. Um, at 20, what I would, if I'm looking back now is I, I did, you know, it, it's tough because I didn't, I didn't do a lot of stupid stuff like a lot of guys do in their twenties. Uh, you know, right, Brad. Right. All right. You know, we did, I, I did, I get, Come you know, on, Jason. I did, <laughs> I, and that's based off no information. Ask my kids. Whatever. I was I'm perfect. Just, I just, I'm just throwing that out there. No, but, um, um, I, uh, I, because I had a son, I had someone that I had to take care of. I was a, I was a 20 year old boy trying to, t trying to take care of a, of a, of a baby. And so I didn't get a, a screw around like with my friends did, you know, a lot during their twenties, I had to grow up really damn quick. And, um, and so if I look back on 20, what I would have said is I, I probably would have gone in the, I would tell my, I would have told myself, um, to go faster because even though I was very ambitious uh, and I did grow pretty quick. I became a very young executive. That was a goal I self, uh, set for myself at, you know, I, by 30, I was there by the age of 29. Um, and, but what I would have told myself at 20 was, um, to go faster, but not at the detriment of the present, because I feel that I, I did that. And, and I think what I mean by that is I could have got where I was quicker by being smarter, um, but also not, um, look, uh, you know, it's not something I'm proud to say. Um, and, uh, you know, I get a little choked up when I actually say it out loud, but, uh, you know, it, it, I wasn't a great father, um, cause I wasn't present. I just was not present for my son. That's something that I try to do for my, you know, my, my daughter and my son now who are, you know, 10 and six respectively. But, um, you know, I wasn't there a lot and, uh, because I was doing, I mentioned, you know, building that network out and being, you know, that my son would have been five years old around that time. Yeah. Um, so guess what? I didn't see him at all during those two weeks. You know what I mean? So like, it's stuff like that. Um, my ambition trumped what I should have really been doing as, as a father and a human being. Now it was all for his benefit because, um, I was, you know, in the story I told myself is that like, I'm, I'm working. So he never has to want for anything. Right. And that, and other, it wasn't a lie. That was true. But it's also because I truly loved what I, I I do, and I and I love doing being in that world and being a part of all of that. But there's times that I'm never going to get back with him, and it's you know it's tough. And so, you know, I've had that conversation with him, and let him know that I'm sorry that. But you know, you know, just to let you know, there there was a there was a point for that of me not being there um, because you know at that time I had to borrow money from my mom and everything else to to survive rent and you know. It, people know California, what is not cheap now, it wasn't cheap back then either. And so, um, so it was, uh, you know, it, it was a tough time and, uh, I could have been a better father. And so I would say move faster by being smarter, but not at the detriment of being present for not just, just to smell the roses, but also be there for my son. Oh, that's great advice and great reflection and something that resonates with both of us because, you know, Brad and I work together, on and off for, you know, the better part of, uh, 23 years now. And, uh, you know, I waited until later in life to have my daughter who's eight. Um, but Brad's kids are now, you know, in their twenties and I watched Brad during that boom. I watched him work like crazy while the kids were young. And I know I'm sure he can speak to his experience there, but I know that for me, um, it's always a battle for my desire to move forward and win and achieve and grow and bring everybody on the team along with me. You get this, yep. you get this amazing fulfillment and this high almost off of the journey, the, the destiny, you know, we're going, we're going, we're going full throttle. And then you have to switch over and go, wait, there's a little person that when I walk in the door, doesn't care how my day was, doesn't care how busy I was, doesn't care how many CEOs I, you know, had coffee with or who I hobnobbed with. 
she wants to tell me about her day. She's had a rough one, whatever that is. And yep. it's been a really conscious thing for me to have to make that switch, you know, every single day and make those tough calls. There are days when my day starts at 4.30 in the morning and I don't take her to school that day, but I try yep. to make up for it the other four days of the week. And that's the yep. only thing we could do. It's maturity and time are the only things that ever give us the perspective to yep. look at things a little bit differently and have a little bit more yeah. balance. Yeah, absolutely. So true. Uh, Jason, you know, we've really enjoyed having you on and um, it was really our pleasure. We appreciate you joining us today. Oh, well, thank you. I'm on, you know, anytime I get to talk to, uh, you know, my sister from another mister and, and, and Brad <laughs> com- coming to, to know you. Um, hey, I'm, I'm just excited to be able to, to do this and, and, you know, I'm blessed and I, I appreciate you guys having me on. Get Real 411 is hosted by Brad Rice and Jamie Cavanaugh, produced by Stuart Jellin, and recorded live from the AmeriFund Home Loan Studio in Simi Valley, California. You can learn more about the show at GetReal411.com and watch full episodes on YouTube. If you're interested in being a guest on Get Real 411, email booking at GetReal411.com. Please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.